Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen, and I thank you so much for listening and supporting the podcast. Uh, definitely a reminder, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go subscribe there, get your uh, free PDF on the top 200 drugs. Good little study guide, uh, whether you're just looking for a refresher in clinical practice or whether you're going through uh, pharmacology classes, preparing for board exams, whatever the, the case may be there. Uh, just a great little thing that, that I put together based upon uh, my experience in taking exams and uh, working in clinical practice for several years. So with that, let's get into the drug of the day, and that's going to be Varenicline. Brand name of this medication is Chantix. Uh, I do see it used a, a fair amount, definitely, and uh, the primary and pretty much the only use I see it used for is smoking cessation. Now, how does this drug work? How does it help patients stop smoking? So if you remember, nicotine receptors play an important role in the body, and uh, they really give that uh, reward, that positive feedback from the action of smoking and ingesting nicotine uh, from tobacco products. So what varenicline does is actually partially, it's considered a partial agonist, so it partially stimulates those nicotine receptors. So it gives you a little bit potentially uh, of that reward sensation. But what it also does when it uh, stimulates those receptors, it helps block those receptors uh, from the full nicotine uh, action that you get from uh, smoking, for example. So again, this drug blocks the action of that nicotine, uh, which helps reduce the reward of smoking. So if you remember uh, that dopamine uh, or dopamine in the uh, central nervous system gives that reward type feedback. So uh, varenicline helps kind of reduce uh, that reward uh, potential. Uh, in addition, uh, there there is possibility it can help um, reduce withdrawal symptoms when patients uh, do pick that stop date and they, they want to quit there. Uh, as far as dosing goes, uh, pretty straightforward for the most part here. Uh, it's a, a little bit of a taper up schedule. Uh, most patients are going to start out with uh, 0.5 milligrams once a day uh, for three days, I believe. And then it's 0.5 twice a day. Uh, that's usually for four days. And if all things are going well, it's tolerated, then we go up to one milligram uh, BID after that uh, first week of uh, titration there. So you can certainly um, run into adverse effects like with any medication. Um, probably one of the most uh, common dose-dependent adverse effects, well, there's, there's probably two of them. Um, one is a GI upset. Uh, so there's a few... Uh, different ways we can can tackle that or potentially alleviate that. So um, one, first, you know, talk with your patient, ask them how they're taking it. So giving it uh, with food or, or right after eating um, and with a full glass of water might help uh, with stomach upset and, and that type of thing. Uh, another possibility uh, that we may have to, to look at is uh, reducing the dose if it's just totally uh, intolerable for the patient uh, to continue to take it due to the, the GI upset and that sort of thing. And then, yeah, if it's, you know, absolutely, I'm not going to take this anymore, well, then, then we've got to find a different option uh, to potentially help uh, these patients quit smoking. So GI upset, insomnia is the other um, most common one that I have seen uh, in clinical practice. Um, also potentially associated with that are abnormal or uh, vivid dreams. So that's definitely something that I, I have seen patients report quite a bit. So again, you're going to have to look at that patient clinically and you know determine the severity and, and the risks versus benefits of, of continuing therapy and that type of thing. Um, but definitely something that uh, you want to recognize and, and be aware that, that patients may experience. Now with something like um, insomnia, for example, uh, that could be due to the drug. That's certainly a, a real possibility. But there's also potential that if the patient has stopped smoking, um, that could be one of the withdrawal symptoms from smoking too. So 
Uh, in practice, in real life, it's sometimes difficult to tease that out as to, to what's doing what. Um, same thing with symptoms of, you know, anxiety and restlessness, uh, headaches. You know, is, is that due to the drug or is that due to uh, withdrawal symptoms from uh, smoking and, and nicotine there? So, again, kind of asking, uh, inquiring with the, the patient about what's going on, the severity of those adverse effects, uh, really, really important things to do. Uh, some rare things that have been reported, uh, psychiatric changes such as, you know, suicidal thoughts or behavior, that has been reported in, in case reports. So, again, extremely, extremely rare, um, but we have had uh, some, some clinical trials come out uh, after the fact, I believe, saying that, you know, maybe there really isn't a, a risk of those, um, you know, adverse effects. So I think, at least from my perspective, that the jury's kind of out there. It's still something I think we should be aware of and, and pay attention to. And I think it's a good thing to do, um, you know, when a patient's starting any medication that may affect the central nervous system. Um, sometimes some really bizarre and, and strange things uh, rarely uh, can happen. So definitely uh, important to um, at least be aware of that and uh, uh, make sure our, our patients are, are staying safe there. And then one other uh, really rare one that has been reported is uh, potentially lowering seizure uh, threshold. So I would say in, in most patients without any risk factors for seizures or, or you know, no history or anything like that, um, you know, I, I haven't ever seen it uh, be an issue in, in clinical practice, not saying it, it hasn't been. Um, but if somebody has a seizure history, then we're probably going to want to uh, do a risk, risk benefit assessment as to, you know, what are other options? Should we consider something else? Because um, which can be a challenge because, you know, one of the other drugs that, you know, we sometimes use for smoking cessation, uh, bupropion, uh, has that risk uh, of lowering that seizure threshold and increasing the risk for seizures. So um, definitely need to, to be a little bit uh, careful there. Okay, so when uh, to quit smoking? This is a, a question that, that comes up with various agents, and I wanted to talk about varenicline uh, uh, quickly here. So, um, when should upon taking the drug, when should patients stop smoking? So, kind of initially, the package insert uh, was indicating uh, day eight you should stop smoking. So, you kind of do that dose titration, and then day eight is going to be your quit date for smoking. Well, you know, in, in clinical practice, there's definitely um, been some different ways of, of doing it now. Um, so you may see patients uh, try to titrate their smoking um, over a period of time. Um, you may see a patient, you know, pick a, a stop date two weeks out or three weeks out. So uh, you really need to work with patients and, and figure out what they want to do, what their goal is, and um, identify which strategy is probably best for your patients. So uh, there is a little bit of, you know, dissent as to, you know, what the best strategy is. And, and I don't think, in my opinion, um, that it's a, a one size uh, fits all type of thing. All right. So let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll finish up with drug interactions. Looking ahead to 2021, we have updated uh, content as far as BCPS, uh, NAPLEX, uh, ambulatory care, medication therapy management, geriatrics exam. All of our resources um, have been uh, updated, so we have been working on that uh, tirelessly uh, to get that up, up and ready to go, and we do that annually. So if you're listening uh, to this podcast later on, two, three, four years down the road, um, we look at our content uh, once a year, uh, right before the, the year's end, usually in the, the fall, early winter, uh, and make sure you have uh, access to the, the most up-to-date content if you're preparing uh, for one of your exams. If you're another healthcare professional, just looking to hone your skills, uh, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. That's got links to everything we have there. Uh, lots of Amazon books. You can get an Audible book for free if it's your first one. Uh, so go try that out. Uh, support our sponsor, meded101.com, and uh, help support this uh, podcast as well. Greatly appreciative uh, to all of you who have, have done that already. 
All right, so let's finish up on drug interactions. With varenicline, there really isn't a ton of drug interactions. So that that's a nice thing, a comforting thing, um, that we generally don't have to think too hard uh, about the, the medication. Um, at least in, in my mind, there's none that, that say, oh my gosh, you know, they're on this drug. No way um, can we use varenicline at all. Um, I do If I do see seizure medications on, on a patient's medication list, that is definitely something I look at and, and think about and um, certainly review on a, a case-by-case basis, whether it's, it's worth the risk or not. Uh, other medications to think about, um, you know, use of alcohol, probably not a good idea, may exacerbate uh, risk for psychiatric changes and things like that. So in general, that's uh, definitely discouraged at a minimum. Uh, quinolone antibiotics, uh, trimethoprim, those can actually increase concentrations potentially of varenicline. Again, probably not a total absolute contraindication. And for quinolones and trimethoprim, you're likely um, not going to be on those medications chronically. But if you happen to notice hey, you know, my patient's reporting a lot more insomnia, a lot more stomach upset, you know, potential other adverse effects. It could be an adverse effect from the antibiotic, but it could be an adverse effect from increased varenicline concentrations as well. So whenever we add new drugs, you got to think about that, okay? You got to think, okay, what other drugs might be affected? And that's a situation where uh, varenicline could be increased. And one last one, a little bit more of a, of a chronic medication, are the H2 blockers. Uh, specifically, cimetidine is probably the, the worst. Um, famotidine uh, potentially could do it as well. So these can increase the concentrations of varenicline. And uh, if you're uh, curious or want to really nerd out, uh, it's potentially uh, due to uh, OCT inhibition. So if you remember, that's a uh, basically a, a transporter channel uh, in the kidney that sometimes pumps out uh, certain drugs and, and things like that. So by the H2 blocker inhibiting um, that particular molecule, that can uh, increase the concentration of varenicline in the bloodstream by essentially reducing uh, the outflow of the drug out through the uh, bladder and, and urine. So, uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for listening. Again, go support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, sign up at Real Life Pharmacology. Get your, your free PDF, uh, certainly at no cost to you. If you enjoyed the show, leave a rating, review, or share us with a classmate. Email us to a student, friend, uh, anyone who's studying pharmacology, I think, could definitely uh, pick up a few practice pearls from this podcast. So hope you enjoyed the podcast today and and found it useful for your practice. I thank you so much for listening. Uh, Take care and, and have a great rest of your day.